to our talk. Uh, my name is Philip Warren, and uh, this is Johan Rensenbrink. Um, we're both software engineers at Fugo Roams, and we're here to talk to you about uh, pushing limits of WebGL and uh, bringing the desktop experience to the browser. Uh, before we get into a lot of the details, uh, I think it's worthwhile sort of revising sort of what we actually mean by that topic, uh, apart from in a catchy uh, title, and I spent far too long trying to think it up. Um, what we mean is we already had an existing desktop application that clients were you know, using routinely. Uh, it was a graphically intensive application, so at any point in time we're serving millions of points up. And it's a resource heavy application. And by that what we mean is before we started this whole process, uh, when the user came in and turned on a whole bunch of layers, which you'll see shortly, uh, we could routinely be using four or five gigabytes of memory. So what exactly is Rome's world? It's an immersive 3D virtual world. Uh, it's also a global scale visualization platform. So anywhere you can fly in the world, if there's data, you'll be able to see it. Uh, this is used at a, by a larger company, Fugro, uh, which is a geospatial intelligence company. Right. Why did we sort of move to WebGL? First of all, Rome's world lends itself uh, to a web delivery and by that we mean is it's a very light application. It has not very many assets or any really uh, built into it. So the initial payload can be quite light. Uh, anything that you see in it is streamed in uh, at runtime and then the application builds assets out of that. Uh, it's an enterprise enterprise application. So if any of you have had experience in that space, you all know the pains of dealing with uh, large IT departments. Uh, and if you roll all out a change and that sort of stuff and you send it to this department to get onto the user's uh, desktops. It can take quite a while. Uh, so if we have a bug, we wanted to see it, you know, users get that fixed as soon as possible. And by moving to WebGL, it allows us to increase our release cycle. So we're actually up to a weekly release cycle with Rome's world at the moment. Uh, so if we have an issue that arises or a bug is reported, we will actually want to try and fix it and roll it out uh, within the seven days. So the user needs to hit F5 and see that new feature or fix. All right, so we'll do a quick demo of uh, Rome's world. I'll get uh, Johan to take control of the computer for us. And if we zoom out and exit full screen, you'll see we are actually gonna do our entire talk inside of the Rome's world application. Uh, whether this is going to be an act of hubris or not, we'll find out over the next 20, 25 minutes or so. Uh, and we'll also exit out of uh, the full screen for the web browser just to show that we are actually Oops. running okay. the whole thing. <laughs> and don't press it. Uh, in the browser as well. All right. So if we just move around a little bit, we'll get to see data getting streamed in and out of the application. In this case, you see the point clouds popping in and out. As we move around, yep. So I don't Great. have much mouse space here. <laughs> um, all right, and obviously in this instance, what we're visualizing is a power network. So when this LiDAR data is you know, captured, it's all uploaded to the cloud, then we run some machine learning algorithms over the top of it, and then it fits this network model uh, to the uh, points. And if we change over to uh, height, mode on the points, so we can see a bit easier, and zoom in, we'll see it's done a pretty good job of matching the two up. I think I might have unloaded it a little bit, oh yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. It's coming in as we go. But of course we can pull a lot more information out of this point cloud than just fitting an actual asset to it. Uh, so we'll just give you a quick demo of a couple of those tools now. The first one is the height, for the minimum height for all the uh, power lines. So we'll yeah. turn the point clouds off so we can see a bit easier. Okay. And then turn on our ground clearance, ground clearance yeah. system. And you'll see this will now pop in. And if we fly to one of them, we can see on this particular power line, 4.33 meters is the lowest point. But if we rotate around to the right, we can see this is loaded in. Wherever there's a power line, this has come in. So once again, if you fly anywhere in the world that has this data available to you, you're about to see it. Another quick uh, tool that we have is the uh, classification on the point cloud. So we'll turn the points back on. 
jump across to a different rendering mode for our point cloud, do a classified. If we just zoom into under the power lines here, we're able to see uh, some banding on the point cloud. This is a specification provided to us from the client. Oh, tabbed again. Yeah, sorry, this uh, keeps happening. Yep. Um, and we're able to turn these on and off individually. Uh, if we zoom out a little bit and fly over to the suburb, it also does general classification as well. So all the houses over here have been targeted as a different point, you know, different color, and all the vegetation is also clearly identifiable. Great. So if we just go back to our talk. Oh, yeah, all right. Before that, sorry. <laughs> we'll uh, zoom out, just give you a bit of an idea of like the scale. As I was saying, is we can just fly anywhere and wherever there's data. So wherever this is high level, high resolution imagery is, there'll be data. So we'll fly in somewhere else. It's Hopefully an interesting be. location. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Let's find out. Uh, okay, well, and you see the engine will not very interesting. request this data from the cloud and like, pull it in and generate all the models and everything else with it. It's coming in, yeah, there we go. Great. All right, now we'll resume our talk. Yeah, uh, sorry. We'll go back to full screen. Yep. There you go. We'll fly back. Oh, it's uh, just going all the way back, okay. All right, uh, before we continue, I think we should cover like what is actually not covered in this talk. So, uh, a lot of the sort of technical challenges of actually creating a world scale visualization tool in Unity. Uh, so data streaming and the cloud architecture and the server systems and how we actually get that into uh, Unity, as well as the floating point accuracy uh, issues. Uh, reason for that is, there's actually a previous Unite talk from some of our other colleagues at um, Fugo Rooms, which is available at this uh, address. Uh, if you give a few seconds to take a photo, that will jot it down. But this will also be available in the slides after. All right. So what did it take to get Rooms World running in the web? Initially, we had to remove some things that are just not compatible for the WebGL platform. Of course, so multi-threading, so that's not available uh, at all in uh, WebGL for, on Unity at the moment. Uh, and we were using that in the desktop version for doing a lot of the heavy lifting and the processing of this data as it comes in uh, before we dropped it into the world. Unfortunately, at the moment, that has to come back onto our main thread, uh, as I said, for now. We also had a caching system, which of course utilized the hard drive quite extensively. So when this data is requested, it would um, load it into the engine as well as onto the, drop it onto the hard drive. So if the user flew away and came back, it wouldn't have to request it from the web again. But for now, this has to be uh, removed because we don't have access to the hard drive, of course. And with that, it's relatively simple and thanks to Unity, we were running pretty quickly, uh, but only briefly. Uh, Unfortunately, this is, we had still have some graphical uh, discrepancies between the two builds, uh, as well as some performance issues. So I think we should go back and revise our initial question of what it took to actually get it run well in the web. So to address those graphical you know, issues and differences we have between the two builds, we had to rewrite some of the shaders uh, because we were using the geometry shaders, uh, for, especially for the point clouds, which you can see here. So there's generally meshes, and then we use the geometry to actually create the polys for each of the points. Um, obviously not available in WebGL, so we had to use a slightly older system of the uh, points. File opening and saving. Uh, because of that new abs abstraction of actually running inside of a browser and sandboxing, we have to effectively upload and download files for, for users when they're actually using the application. So we just write, you know, put a bit of wrap around that, and it's not too tricky. We also have an info panel, which is a little system that allows us to click on objects and it'll just render a bit of HTML and CSS, get a bit of information and stuff. Uh, but of course, now that we're actually in a browser, we can just leverage that and just wrap the iframe. So once again, actually a bit of a simplification. Once those things out of the way, you know, we're graphically comparable, but there's still a bit of work to do. 
So what are some of the other challenges that we came across? Cross-origin resource sharing. So if you've done a lot of front-end web development, this is a security uh, feature of the browsers that sort of prevent you from requesting stuff from all over the different servers. And our desktop version just mm, didn't care. It just grab it and it would work just fine. But now we're actually in the browser, we have to adhere to these restrictions. But because we had most of the server infrastructure under our own control, we could set the correct permissions and get around that. But it's something to definitely be aware of, and uh, every now and then it still crops up. And then the biggest one, of course, all is memory. So as I mentioned, we were quite heavy in memory, and the restrictions on WebGL is on a 64-bit build, you get a two gigabytes of space. On a 32-bit build, you only get one gigabyte of space. And those are the hard limits, but they're not guaranteed either. So if there's those resources aren't available, and you request it, your application's gonna crash. So memory is definitely very important. So it's been a long time of memory. And once we were happy with it, we went back and we did some more memory optimizations. And further memory optimizations, and we're still going on with it. Uh, so the more we've managed to reduce that, the easier it is to get it running on all the platforms. All right, uh, to go into more details about this, I'll hand over to Johan, and he'll take you through that. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Uh, right, so Phil's giving you a bit of an overview over how exactly uh, we've got we've got Realms World into the web, we've run into these issues. How exactly can we solve these? Um, what did we do? How do we get there? So uh, the first thing we want to try and understand with uh, the web development is what exactly is different, uh, what's, wh why, why is this different, why are we running into these issues? So. This is something that you, uh, if, if you're doing any web, web film, you probably would have encountered. This is the, uh, the infamous uh, dialogue of running out of memory. Uh, fortunately, this is just a picture. I swear. Um, but yeah, so wh why, is, why is the memory different in web? Where does the memory live? Uh, this is basically, the main thing you want to know is where it lives. It's, it's different. You're, basically, your users aren't able to request all your um, all, all their assistance resources up front, you can't use all the RAM. Uh, as Phil mentioned, there's, there's limits. So the main difference with the memory is that it lives in layers, so it's kind of a stack. There's, there's your operating system, and there's a browser, and then there's the Java virtual machine. And even then, Unity is basically, uh, uh, it's basically fighting other components of the, the browser. Uh, for memory, it's, 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 it's competing for it. So the main thing of interest here is the Unity heap. Uh, the, the, one, the one thing that actually isn't really restricted is graphics memory. So when you're, having that, when you're developing a WebGL application and you've got, you've, got that, you've got that limit of two gigabytes, try and do everything on, on, on your uh, graphics card if you can. Uh, again, not everything can be done, but it, it helps to know that. Uh, so one of the issues that... Uh, cropped up during the initial development, initially when WebGL became available uh, for Unity as a, as a target build uh, deployment, is the heap size juggling. And heap size juggling basically, uh, it's basically when you do a build in WebGL, uh, in your player settings you have to specify an amount in megabytes, uh, which is what Unity actually requests up front, uh, it reserves this space, and basically Anything you do, so you're loading meshes, creating textures, etc., it uses this heap space. The problem here is that because you have to specify a fixed amount, there's two cases, uh, two things that can happen. Well, three things that can run well, but <laughs> in, in some cases, uh, you can run it. If you set that number too low, what happens is if your, your application is loading all these resources and it, can't, it can't, doesn't have enough, it's going to crash because it doesn't have enough memory. On the other side, well, why don't we just request everything up front? Uh, basically, because your user might not be able to, uh, your, your user's browser may not be able to cope with that to request. So, I mean, most people have, whatever, two, two gigabytes, four gigabytes free, right? But there's a lot of things involved. So there's your browser tabs. Again, this goes back to the fact that your browser kind of, well, not your browser, but Unity, Unity's WebGL process has to, again, fight for these resources. It doesn't have this nice, clean chunk of memory available to it. Uh, so fortunately, Unity's actually 
kind of helped us here uh, fairly recently in Unity 2018.2. They've introduced something called dynamic memory growth. And what that is, is basically if you're targeting WebAssembly, which is now the default as well, uh, we have the nice little benefit here of being able to give it a small number, so 50 megabytes, 100 megabytes, and Unity will actually request more memory as it needs it. So we actually get rid of that, that, that juggling effort, that constant uh, pain of having to go back and figure out what an exact, what an exact uh, nice size is for your builds. Uh, another important difference with the memory in the web is your garbage collector. So garbage collection, what is that? Well, well you know, uh, it basically it gets done for you most of the time in most cases. So, but in the web, uh, while it's still done for you, there is one limitation with this. Basically, rather than running whenever it wants, it can only run between frames or at the end of a frame. So basically, uh, if you're loading everything up front and you have got this big complex start method or uh, you're, you're doing things in a, in a big for loop or a while loop, it's all in the same frame and you have all these temporary allocations, it's just going to all grow up, it can't release anything in between, so it's just going to pile up and create this gi uh, giant spike. And in some cases, if it's big enough, it can actually straight away crash your application. So you want to, want to, what you want to try and do is effectively split your loading time over multiple frames if, you, if you're doing this at, uh, at runtime, uh, loading assets at runtime. Okay, uh, so now that we know a little bit about how the memory how the memory is sorted in the web, how can we actually track it? So in most cases, uh, you might not be able to actually use the, the Unity profiler directly. You might not have access to the editor, or for any, it might be happening on the user's machine and you want to see what's going on. So uh, we've actually got a nice little solution here, basically just using some, um, some C-sharp APIs, to GC, uh, namespace, etc. So uh, Phil, can you bring up the... Sure. Um, so I hope you can see that. I'm going to stand in front of it, but uh, we have this bar at the bottom of the screen, and we we basically query the uh, the different types of heap information that Unity provides to us at a runtime. So it consists of an, a, a few different types. So the main one is the the total the total the total uh, heap size that we've allocated. So our application is using WebAssembly in this case. Uh, so we've, it seems to have grown up to 500 megabytes, 512. It should be pretty stable there. Uh, we've also got a reserved heap, which basically consists of uh, your Unity native objects, so meshes, textures, fonts, uh, and any, any overheads from WebAssembly and the Unity runtime itself. Uh, what's interesting to note here is that both the reserved and the total heap spaces do not shrink. They can only grow. However, fortunately for us, it doesn't mean that we eventually run out of space. Uh, if we keep unloading and loading assets, it reuses the space as it can. There's a little bit of fragmentation, but generally I've, I've not seen that being an uh, issue in most cases. Uh, the final one I wanted to mention was our current memory. Uh, but current memory, would, well, I probably should have named it better, but basically it's our, uh, it's our managed memory. So your plain C-sharp objects, your, your, your lists, your arrays, uh, vertex arrays, Byte arrays, etc. And fortunately for us, it actually grows and shrinks, so we can kind of see at uh, runtime why we're where the peak of our memory is going. Okay, so we can track the track the memory in the build a little bit, uh, but the majority of the tracking should be happening in the editor. And what better way to do this is the Unity profile. Uh, so it's known to everyone. It's it's it, well most people. <laughs> It's, uh, it's easy, it's easy to use, it's reliable, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty quick and you, you can find a, lot about, uh, find a lot of information about your application with it. So while the profiler isn't specific to, uh, to WebGL, it's something that you definitely need to take proper care of. If, if you see allocations and you see CPU spikes of performance, try, and, try not to ignore them especially in the web, just because of the, uh, the limitations you might run into. Also the fact that there are some performance differences in the web. When you can try and deprofile, uh, the reason I say this is because while the profiler, the profiler allows you to track your allocations, you can see which frames are heavy, which frames you've got big spikes of memory, but you really want to track down exactly which methods, which API calls, which functions are causing these spikes so you can, you can round them out, you can isolate them, and you can fix them. 
try and profile outside the editor. Uh, again, because there is not just because of the editor overhead itself, but is it things actually run differently. Um, you can't deprofile a WebGL build directly at the moment. What you can do is build a standalone build. If you're only targeting web, I still recommend having a standalone build, uh, even if it's just for profiling, because it can be very handy to see the, uh, the differences without the editor. So what about managed memory? So the profiler allows us to track things like your, your meshes, your textures, and kind of what's happening in a frame, but what about the lifetime of the, uh, of the application? Where is that memory staying? How do we track that? Again, Unity has been nice enough to provide us with a uh, in-construction API. It's experimental, so you might have heard of it. It's called the Memory Profiler API. And basically what it allows you to do is get a, a good insight into the specifics of your heap. So you can see exactly what you managed, where you, both, both, both managed and native memory. So anything you're really using, you can, you can track it down. You can see the uh, associations, etc. So what I've actually got on the right there is a, a screenshot. Is this is not Unity's API. Because it's experimental, basically their front end is a bit rough around the edges. This is a uh, third party application. It's, it's free. Uh, if you do a search for it, we've got a, we've got a link as well. Let's bring that up. Uh, and again, because the, it is an experimental API, so it struggles a bit sometimes. So try and, if you have a large, complex system, try and isolate the bits, because if it's large enough, it might not be able to cope with it and just hang, or well, hopefully. All right. Um, so now we can track the memory. What do we do about the memory? We want to try and get rid of the memory. Uh, how do you have as less men uh, how How do you... Try and get. How do you get your application to have as little, little memory as possible by not having any memory? But since that's not possible, we want to try and get rid of the actual memory uh, as soon as we can. So, one of the largest uh, footprints of memory, especially for us, because we're dealing with so much uh, texture streaming, is textures. So textures are quite large, even if you're dealing with lots, lots of small ones, or you're dealing with well, textures. <laughs> uh, they're basically the majority of uh, cases where memory is an issue. So what a lot of people don't know about is that you can discard the uh, texture memory at runtime uh, as well as in the editor. If your assets are available up front, so for example you have images in your editor at build time, then this is basically uh, shown by a read write enable checkbox when you click on your images. You want to try and disable this unless you absolutely need to modify or read individual pixels from the image at runtime. Uh, if you're procedurally generating textures, so you're streaming them, you're downloading them, then there are API calls to do this. Uh, on the texture themselves, you can simply apply it and use the API, so make it no longer readable. Uh, similarly, if you're downloading textures, you can simply call Unity Web Request, get texture, and use that API directly rather than having to do this afterwards on the texture. Another method of getting rid of uh, memory is compression. It's, it might seem pretty obvious, but texture compression has a pretty big impact on the memory size. Um, of course, compression has its downsides itself, so you can have a loss of quality, uh, especially if you're doing it run at uh, runtime. Compression can have a bit of a performance impact as well. So you want to try and do this up front. Uh, if you have to do it at runtime, if you're downloading assets, try and do it in a loading screen, but even if, if it's, it's not too bad if you do it occasionally spread across frames. Um, so again, you can't always compress your textures, but if, if you can afford to, try and do it. It's a simple API call again, it's called compress. And finally, uh, <laughs> this might seem a bit obvious, but you try and clean up when you're done. So when you destroy your game objects, your textures are not actually being destroyed uh, as well. So that memory for your textures is actually left behind. Because the reason for this is because textures, uh, include other, or any Unity native objects are, well, they're native objects. They're meshes. They're they have uh, they're tied to Unity's native uh, bridge, basically. So the way to do this, it's not that complicated. It's similar to a game object. You just want to call destroy on it. Uh, if you find it difficult to track your individual textures, you're constantly loading dynamically, or you just have lots of them. Uh, don't worry, you can just use Unity's built-in, again, there's a, there's a method for this, there's the resources API, 
you can just call unload unused assets, which will actually do a reference count, and anything that's not in your scene at the moment will get destroyed. Uh, you don't have to worry about things that still need to be loaded. They'll get reloaded from your assets afterwards if you call this and then load uh, new textures in the scene. Uh, similar to textures, we have meshes. Meshes are quite large as well in, in some cases. So an in, in individual vertex can be as small as two, 12 bytes, so the position basically. But that 12 bytes become a, becomes a lot larger when you're dealing with, say, uh, a couple of million vertices on your screen at once. So similar to textures, you can actually dispose of the CPU copies. I don't remember if in the editor there's a read-write uh, flag. I assume there is for, uh, for meshes. But again, uh, during runtime, if you're generating meshes yourself or you're loading them from asset bundles, you can, um, again, call. This is basically similar to apply, but it's called a bit. It's got a different name for some reason. Uh, there is one gotcha with this though, uh, which Textures doesn't have, which is basically if you're using mesh colliders, the mesh colliders depend on your meshes. So you want to make sure that if you're doing this procedurally, call this API after you've got your mesh collider set up. Uh, try and test this change in the build, especially if you're discarding the CPU copy, uh, both for textures and meshes or any other native objects. The reason I say this is because when you call uh, the apply method or upload method in the editor, it doesn't actually do anything. Uh, it's not stupid, it's just because the editor needs this, this reference to the memory for debugging purposes and whatever editor things it does. Uh, so if, you, if you're doing this, try and test it straight away because otherwise you're going to end up having all these changes in your build and suddenly things are throwing exceptions and weird stuff's happening and just, just because of this small change that it's in, in the wrong order, etc. Uh, finally, try and dispose your meshes. Uh, again, it's a native object, so just call destroy on it, or use resources on like unused assets. So now that we know how to get rid of a, uh, a fair bit of memory, in most cases, textures and meshes consist of most of your, uh, well, most of your scene. Uh, what about performance? So we try and combine everything we can. Uh, Unity actually does this as well, a little bit for you, the dynamic <coughs> batching. Uh, however, it does have its limitations, especially if you're moving things. Uh, it has to recalculate all your all the meshes that can be combined. And this has a CPU impact, uh, which can actually be more negative than rendering them individually. Unless you're dealing with very dynamic content, with constantly loading in single objects and unloading them, then it's fine to just let Unity do it. Otherwise, try and combine things. Uh, there is a little bit of a negative opinion about batching sometimes that well, if I've got my giant block of geometry, or you've got your, your, uh, your textures all atlas and stuff, but now I can't nicely click on my individual objects anymore. This isn't true. You can still uh, have individual individual functions, differences in your in your instances. So take our point clouds, for example. So here you can see quite a number of points on the screen, and they all have different colors. Uh, and some of these cases are very simple. You just have... Um, Instead of using a material color, you use vertex colors. If it's not colors, you can use different vertex channels. And if, if vertex channels aren't enough for you, you can use textures even. So we actually have, we use textures to turn off individual classified points using, a, uh, using the texture as a dictionary lookup, basically. So to give you a bit of an example, uh, I'll just do a bit of a fly through now where the points are loading in as basically giant blocks of data and you can see see um, how that's done and it basically gives, it gives us much better performance and um, a nicer experience for the user. Okay, so there might be a little bit of stuttering here unfortunately. Uh, this is due to the fact that we are single threaded and we'd really like to get those threads back at some stage. <laughs> so, <laughs> some, uh, some final tips for uh, do doing any WebGL development, even if you're not transferring from an existing desktop application. Uh, try and familiarize, familiarize yourself with the WebGL build system. So while you hit build and it creates a folder with all your, your, your uh, distributed files, it's nice and it's all there for you, but there is quite a bit involved. There's IL2CPP, uh, mscript, and etc. It helps to know about it. It might solve some of your issues. Try and keep up to date with some of the browser features. Uh, what, the reason I say this is because, oh, I mean, yeah, it's web, de WebGL development, but what does the browser mean? Uh, what, what's, what, why does that involve us? Basically, 
Uh, a good example of this is load times for WebGL in Unity are one of the biggest complaints. For some people it takes 20, 30 seconds even for, uh, or, or more, whatever, for their application to load and your users are not going to wait. They, they want to do something else. It's taking too long, they're bored. Uh, two months ago, Chrome, well, just under two months ago, Chrome has actually released a new version of their browser and they've completely overhauled their WebAssembly loading. And without any changes on our side, our users are now uh, seeing half that loading time. So they're now seeing 10, 10, 5 to 10 seconds, which is a massive improvement over the previous. Uh, try and leverage the browser features themselves as well. So the existing ones, uh, when you do web development, one thing you can learn about browsers is that they cache. They cache quite aggressively. If your users have to download content, even the WebGL files themselves, try and cache them. The way to do this is via uh, the HTTP headers on your service. Um, another benefit here is uh, decompression. So GZIP files broadly, uh, so again, these apply to not just any, any files you download externally, but also your Unity files. Uh, so the benefit of decompression is that, well, getting the browser to do it for you is that it's faster via the browser rather than JavaScript. And personally, for us, we find that there's also a massive memory benefit because you don't have to have both the decompressed and the compressed asset in your Unity heap at the same time. You only have the decompressed output, basically halving your, the, the memory footprint of that frame. Uh, lastly, I'd like to recommend visiting Unity Forum's WebGL section. Uh, don't under underestimate it. It's got quite a lot of useful content. Uh, basically, things like loading, loading files, uh, uploading files, downloading files, weird edge case scenarios. There's, there's a lot there that the documentation may not necessarily cover. I, I visit the forum myself quite, quite often, and hey, uh, if you ask a question, maybe I'll be the answer. I'll be the one to answer it. Um, so, in terms of Realms world, what we want to do continuing our WebGL development are try and monitor our memory usage uh, programmatically. So as you've seen before, we had the little bar at the bottom, but we want to try and integrate that and into our logic and get our um, system to basically handle our users suddenly loading millions of things at once and just handle it rather than running out of memory. Uh, continue our optimization, get performance better, get, get less, uh, reduce our memory as, as much as we can so we can get as much content to our users as possible. Multi-threading is one of the first things we had to get rid of, but we'd like to get it back as soon as possible. It's been on the Unity roadmap for a while now, but it seems that it's now targeted, uh, it's, it's, it's linked to a version, 2019.1. 2019 is not too far around the corner, it's, it's not green, but it's, uh, hopefully we'll get it, we want to get on top of that. And uh, really, really get on that. Um, yeah, that's it. All right. Um, so going forward, we really see WebGL as sort of our primary means of like deploying our application. And if you're doing a sort of an enterprise application, we really recommend you use that uh, system as well. Uh, here's our contact details if you want to ask us any questions. Uh, as also, we are recruiting. Uh, <laughs> So if anything you've seen here today is, uh, looks interesting to you, come uh, talk to us, or we have a few other uh, Rome's World, well, Rome's developers in the front row, if you want to grab one of them. And we'll also be at the after party as well, of course. Thank you. Of course.